I'm Patrick Pacheco. Coming up on Theater, All the Moving Parts, a fascinating chat with Angelina Avalon, Broadway's premier makeup artist who is a key player to the development of the characters on stage. Hello, I'm Patrick Pacheco. Welcome to this episode of Theater All the Moving Parts with Angelina Avalon, who has designed makeup for over 100 Broadway shows. These include Cabaret, War Paint, The Little Mermaid, and Young Frankenstein. Her expertise, whether applied to fashion icons or classic monsters, adds a crucial finishing touch to the character. Welcome, Angelina. Your makeup is flawless. Why is that? Oh, Patrick, you're very kind. I think it's delighting. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever it or is. Or the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> it looks great. Um, in Thank 2017, you. you had the challenge, Angelina, of creating the makeup for War Paint, which was about the rivalry between two cosmetic titans, Elizabeth Arden and Helena Rubinstein. How did you go about meeting that challenge? It was a, a dream show for a makeup, a makeup artist and a makeup designer. First of all, um, these are two iconic women. Helena Rubinstein, larger than life, a full life, an odyssey. Elizabeth Arden, a makeup pioneer in the field. They revolutionized makeup. Um, these two women were extremely successful. Uh, in a world, uh, in a business dominated by men, their intelligence uh, and um, I think their sense of freedom, their desire to teach women to be um, individuals. And did you find, Angelina, that uh, you needed to use their products, uh, obviously, on Christine Eversol? who played Elizabeth Arden, and on Patti LuPone, who played Helena Rubinstein? Or did you find that you could uh, create and go with whatever makeup you felt the characters deserve once you read Doug Wright's script? You know, I wanted to be true to these women and to honor their creation. I mean, Elizabeth Arden practically branded the color pink. Uh-huh. Even had her diamonds dyed in pink. At the time, I was very fortunate. The Jewish Museum had an exhibit, a very extensive exhibit on Helena Rubinstein. And I was able to immerse myself and just get a little bit closer to this incredible pioneer, incredible woman, a genius for her time. Um, and uh, um, it was very interesting to see the actual products displayed at the museum her portraits, her clothes, her jewelry. She had an extensive jewelry collection. She was just a collector of the fine things. And did you use their makeup, uh, that pink that you just referred to? I was able to, to go to the red door and look at some original uh, products by mm -hmm. Elizabeth Arden. And then I went and looked at the Elizabeth Arden makeup line. We used some Elizabeth Arden products. Um, Helena Rubinstein it was more difficult to find Rubinstein products here in the United States. They're no longer sold in, in this country. But what I did was I looked at ads. I researched her products. I read about her colors and color combination. She created this, this makeup charts at a time. She taught women how to apply their makeup, coordinated eye color with lips, which was very revolutionary for that time. It was really a labor of love. I remember spending weeks probably prior to starting the process, just swatching colors uh -huh. and trying to match the colors and be, stay true to the period because their careers span over 50 years. I mean, we right. start in 1914 and we end the show in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, 
Rubinstein created a look for herself. And that look was very theatrical, something she called the theater of the face. It was the red lips. It was very theatrical, very pale skin, powdered, a smoky eye, um, an, a beautifully arched eyebrow, and kind of a signature red mouth, uh -huh. uh, nail polish, red nail polish, a very classic look. And her hair was dark and pulled back in a chignon, or at one time she had this beautiful braid. There is a gorgeous photograph of her with a braid holding this beautiful African mask, wearing surrealist gloves, leather and raffia. And the braid was, of course, an homage to antiquity and the Helen of Troy. You mentioned earlier makeup charts, and I gather that you create your own makeup charts. You created your own makeup chart for Patti LuPone and a makeup chart for Christine Ebersole, as well as for everybody else in the cast. Could you kind of d describe what a makeup chart does and how that helps you as a blueprint for the characters that you do the makeup for? When we I met with um, Patti LuPone and Christine Ebers Ebersole, I had a book, a Bible full of research for each of those characters. We went through all of their um, uh, costume changes from the top of the show through the end of the show and uh, established what that look was. We had some makeup tests. We had makeup and wig tests. Uh, we tried different looks, different uh, lip colors, um, foundations, blush, you know, a lighter pink, a brighter pink, uh, eye shape, eyebrow, nail polish color. And you know, it's it's amazing of how many shades of red there are. Yeah. I mean, finding the right shade of red. So I practically had a library of that for her. And then the same thing with Christine, because um, Elizabeth Arden's makeup actually changes a little bit. And of course, there is a line in the play about her Gauguin pink uh -huh. at the very end in the 60s. So I really researched and found what that Gauguin pink was. And I had to find colors because it doesn't exist, but colors that look like the Gauguin pink. And the other challenge, of course, is once we have our makeup sessions, we find what all these colors are. Uh, we go through the play we identify what these changes are in, in, in what scene mm -hmm. uh, of the play. Uh, we then begin to gather these products and create this makeup kits for the actors. Now, if the actor starts um, in, in, at the top of the show, they, they'll start in their dressing room, but then there are quick changes. If, they, if there is a quick change on stage, then there is a little makeup kit for them, a makeup station that needs to be set up with a mirror, with a light, where that change will happen. Now we have to also time these changes because mm -hmm. it's not only about the makeup. The makeup is part of a costume change. There will be a costume change, most likely a wig change and the makeup change. So during the technical rehearsal, um, all departments get together, we have a discussion, we have a discussion with the actor, and we figure out how this change is going to happen, where the change is going to happen, who is going to assist the actor. Also, because once you establish the makeup, then it is up to the actor to continue to put it on performance after performance after performance in, in, in that way. So they have to sort of follow your lead and your blueprint so that they know exactly what to do. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, in relation to that, do actors have a strong opinion of how they want their makeup to look, or do they basically follow your lead? Yes, the actors, uh, and, and in this particular case, Patti LuPone and Christine Ebersole, after the opening of the show, had to apply their own makeup. I was with them through uh, uh, the out-of-town tryout in Chicago. And then we came to New York and we spent the tech and previews together until the opening night. And then after that, they had to take over and do their own makeup. The actors have strong opinion uh, about their makeup because, and it's, it's understandable because they embody this, this, this characters. 
they have put, especially in the case of Christine and, and Patty, they put a lot of thought and a lot of research into their roles. Uh, they also researched the period, uh, um, collect photographs. Patty had uh, wonderful photographs of Rubinstein in her dressing room. I mean, they draw inspiration from those images. And yes, they do have strong opinions. There are certain things there uh, they feel that are important. Patty said it's very important. Her mouth is very important. Helen huh. Rubinstein's mouth, the red mouth is very important. Uh -huh. Interesting. And the brows, the brows had to be much darker than Patty's own um, eyebrows. So we had to darken the brows, fill in the brows. With Christine, uh -huh. uh, it was a softer. She said she's a little bit softer. Elizabeth Arden, I mean, she appears to be softer. She was a tough businesswoman. Uh -huh. But there was sort of a softness because Arden wanted to be part of country club and high society. And it was all about pink and softness. And the, the uh, creative person, the person uh, among the creative uh, uh, collaborators that you work with, probably most importantly is the lighting designer because what might look pink in the dressing room might look a different color once it's under light. Uh, is the lighting designer the person that you collaborate closest to? It's everybody really. It's the costume designer, the wig designer. And then of course, after we, uh, create all of this, you know, we, we work, we get all these pieces together, the costumes are built, uh, the scenery is in the theater and we're ready to, to go into tech. And now the lighting designer is painting because they're also painting on top of what everyone has done and they're sculpting with shadows. So yes, that does change. The first thing I do is when I go into the theater, the first day we're in the theater is to just sit in the house and look at what the lighting designer is doing. What is happening on set? Or often I'll have somebody stand in a white shirt on uh -huh. stage just to see what the light is doing. We've done tests like that. Just to, sometimes there are issues, you know, you, you can't get the color is not right or the actor is washing right out or something is just not reading. And we've tried this color and that color and just not working. We had somebody stand next to Michael Crawford in a white shirt. Michael Crawford, uh, you, you mentioned- As Dance of the Vampires. That's I'm right, sorry. yes. We wanted to find, identify what, what, what the issue was and why the makeup wasn't working. And we, we figured it out. I had to completely change Michael's foundation. When you're dealing with something that's fairly extreme in a monster, uh, how do you, uh, in terms of what you just mentioned earlier, how does that read? Uh, especially since you are also dealing with dis distances. You've got people in the first row, you've got people in the second balcony. How do you adjust the makeup so that it reads to an audience fairly uniformly? Well, it, it is very challenging in the theater. It's a constant dance because there are entrances and exits. Sometimes they're very close to the audience. Sometimes they're really far back. So we have to find it, and, and, and it depends on how they're lit. You know, if the action is taking place, you know, stage left, a group of actor, actors will be very well lit, lit and maybe the rest are in, in shadow. Uh -huh. I mean, also the lighting designer kind of directs where the audience will look at and pay attention because maybe over here there is a quick change happening. So we don't want the light on the quick change, uh, but we want them to focus here. So it is it is very challenging. So once the, we've designed the makeup and we, we've, we've created the look, then when we get to the technical rehearsals, a lot does change because mm -hmm. we have to fine tune what we have done. In, in the case of uh, the young Frankenstein, the monster, uh, we spent uh, a lot of time uh, finding that perfect color green because mm -hmm. Mel Brooks, you know, was something that Mel said from the very beginning, he must be green. <laughs> the monster has to look, must be green. But it was up to me to find the right shade of green and, it took a while. We got it. Mel was very happy. <laughs> but it was very challenging finding that right shade of green because 
this is the thing. The makeup also has to service the play. Mm -hmm. The makeup should be subtle enough so it does not pull focus. It doesn't become all about the green because you have to remember that it's about the character. Uh -huh. For the audience, it's very important to be able to see Schuller Hansley's expressions. Yeah. And he has a wonderful face. And, and the monster goes through this journey of being, you know, the first time you see him, he's this scary, awful looking creature. The audience is really scared. And then, you know, when you get to putting on the Ritz, I mean, <laughs> you just, you fall in love with him. Yeah. And then he falls in love with Elizabeth and there is this great romantic story. So you have to create this lovable monster on one hand and a very scary sort of, you know, somebody who's everybody's like terrified of in the very beginning. That's an excellent point. And one thing I wanted to talk to you about was Cabaret and you're creating the look for Michelle Williams and for Alan Cumming. In terms of Sally Bowles, she goes from being this effervescent, bouncy uh, nightclub entertainer in the Kit Kat Club to a point where she has an abortion. How does her makeup change between the beginning of the show and the second act that becomes darker? I think that was a once in a lifetime opportunity. I feel so fortunate to have worked with Alan and Michelle and just to have worked on this amazing production and a great story. The 1920s, Weimar Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, the cabaret, and this wonderful, complicated, complex characters. You know, how to create this iconic looks for them for the stage. In the case of Michelle, Sally Bowles, you know, she's, you know, it's interesting because in the script, she is not that talented. Mm -hmm. She can't sing, she can't act, but she has this amazing magnetic personality. And she has this cabaret act. Mm -hmm. She's glamorous, she's eccentric. So we created a look of the 20s, a very fashionable look. The inspiration was Marlena Dietrich, Margot Leon, another very famous cabaret performer from the time. And the look was, you know, was simple in a way. Um, very, the eyebrows, again, the eyebrows were very important. We got, we drew some inspiration from Louise Brooks and Tita Barra, two uh, American Hollywood actresses from the time. We had this very specific lashes, top and bottom lashes for Michelle. And, and an eyeliner and a very bright matte red lipstick. And then how did that makeup change, Angelina, once the second act comes and she has her abortion, she gets in a fight with Cliff, how does that makeup change? Does everything get drained out? Act one is very bright because it's the 20s. Mm -hmm. And then slowly, as we near the 30s, 1933, when we know what happens, it was sort of the beginning of the end. In Act Two, the mood changes. And the same thing with Michelle's, with, with Sally Bowles. Look, the, the lashes come off, the lipstick is slotted, and we take off most of the lipstick. She cries on stage. It's a very heartbreaking, very emotional scene, but we have a quick change where she takes the lashes off uh -huh. and the lips come off. And in the end, she is sort of broken and the look is sort of very plain. And the mood shifts, you know, we have this colorful world in Act One and in an Act Two, it's pretty much everything is black and white. Uh -huh. The makeup of the Kit Kat the girls changes, um, their lipstick is black. They use a white powder over uh, their Act One makeup. We wipe off all the red, all the color from their faces. Act two is this, it's almost like a black and white movie and very stark. You also did the makeup for the color purple. What are some of the special demands in terms of makeup for an African-American cast? It all begins with the story and it's the story of two sisters. And the play starts in the early 1900s in the South. And it's a story that spans over 30 years. I worked with a wonderful uh, costume designer, Paul Taswell. We collaborated very closely on what they should look like, what they were wearing, how much money they had, 
Uh, these were teenage girls at the time in the 1900s. Nobody wore makeup except for entertainers, except uh -huh. for someone like Sugar Avery. When she comes to town, I mean, she is an entertainer. She's a woman who has traveled. We did research. I mean, she, the inspiration was Josephine Baker uh -huh. and dancers, performers from the Cotton Club. And she is somebody who is very glamorous. She is of the moment. Her clothes are beautiful, beaded gowns. She has costumes and makeup and wonderful hair. But the other characters, there is makeup because you need to wear makeup in order for the, for the lighting and for the stage. But it's very subtle, very natural makeup. And then in La Chance, who played Silly, she started, you know, she was playing a 14-year-old girl and then a 20-year-old woman, a 30-year-old woman, and she's in her 40s at the end of the play or 50s at the end of the play. So her makeup was very subtle. Her makeup barely changed, or uh -huh. if it did, it was so subtle that it looked like no makeup. And is it the same palette uh, applied to uh, black skin as opposed to white skin? Is it the same makeup uh that you're using? We used a lot of MAC products, MAC makeup. MAC has a wide range of foundation colors, wonderful um, powders, and you could, you know, and also because it's especially the MAC Pro Store uh, is a makeup artist line. So you can mix also, you can mix a lot of your colors. Mm -hmm. They're pigments, it's just an extensive makeup artist line. Mm -hmm. And we found the right shades for each actor. When I work on a show, I think as an artist, it's about painting, it's about finding the right shade, it's about working with the actors. Sometimes it's trial and error. We create this over several long weeks during tech it's you know four weeks of, of technical rehearsals a project begins six months prior to going into the theater so it's a long process um and um uh, i i think that with with any show it's just finding what the palette is spending a lot of time with the cast, making sure that you have the right products, making sure that everything looks historically accurate, that it services the character, the needs and the wants of the character. Exactly. And their development throughout the play. And then once we get on stage, under stage lights, is then also the process continues. We want to make sure that you can see the actor's face, and everything looks, uh, the colors look uh, look uh, accurate, that the actors as a group uh, look uh, wonderful together. If there is any color correcting that you need to do, well, that, that, that's the time to do it. Well, thank you. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. I greatly appreciate the time. And uh, people will never quite look at makeup on stage the same after watching this program. Thank you so well, much for joining Thank you for us. having me, Patrick. It, it was an honor. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more fascinating conversations with artists and stage professionals as New York Theater, The Fabulous Invalid, regains its invaluable place in American culture. I'm Patrick Pacheco.